Good evening. evening. It's good to see everyone here tonight. It's certainly good that we can gather together to worship our God. It's been such a good day so far as we've worshiped God, and uh, it's been good tonight to be here as well. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, we'll start at the end of chapter 3, so chapter 3 and verse 18. I'd like to continue our study in... Corinthians and ask the question, how should we view our leaders? How should we view leaders in the church? This was something that affected Paul, and it's really something that we deal with even today. So let's consider that question. Before we jump into that question, notice that Corinthians is a book that, that deals with many different issues. In chapters 1 through 6, we see that Paul addresses some reports that he'd heard from close people. The first one being division, and that's what we've been talking about, and we'll conclude that subject tonight. He also addresses a few other subjects as well, dealing with sexual immorality, uh, how they should deal with conflicts, whether they should go to court, uh, and, and things of that nature. Then we see that Paul addresses many of the questions that the Corinthians themselves are asking. And so he refers to the questions that they'd sent them dealing with, with marriage, with meat and idols, and also worship and the resurrection. Tonight we're looking at, starting in chapter 3 and verse 18, Paul had heard about the very real problem of division that had existed among them, and division in such a way that they were uh, gravitating towards certain leaders and creating factions, saying, I'm of Paul or of Paulus or different uh, groups. And Paul says that that is counter to what God wants in the church. We're not to be a collection of factions that go after this person or that person, but we are to be a united body of Christ. He is our master, and we are his servants. And so Paul addresses that, and I I love the way he does that. He starts with the cross. If we're dealing with problems in our life and and attitude problems and, and factions, Paul brings us back to really what it is that unites us, what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And he points to the foolishness of the cross, Many people in their wisdom and their love for wisdom, particularly at this time, had followed after these factions. And Paul says that it is the foolishness of the Christ that really binds us all together that saves us. Then he points to the fact in in chapter 2 that we all have the same spirit. And it is that spirit that reveals God's word to us. The, The foundation of the cross, God's word. Those are the things that unite us. In chapter 3, he talks about the relationship that these leaders had played with the church. And so he says, "Who who is Apollos anyway, and who is Paul? He says, they are servants of the Lord. And he goes on to use three images where he talks about a field. And so Paul and Apollos, they're field hands. They are servants. It is God that gives the growth. And so he talks about their work in the field. And they had different roles, but it is God that was giving the increase. It then talks about the fact that the church is a building. And we see that image used elsewhere in Scripture as well. And Paul says that they are laboring there as they build within that building. Those that were converts, those that were Christians, not every convert will stay faithful or live as they should. But Paul's job was to continue to preach God's word. The, the last image that he uses there is the uh, one of a temple. And so this was no ordinary building, but this was a holy building, a temple designed for worship. And so it is for the church. We are God's temple. And that should tell us something about how we should act. Really, all of this has been building up to the direct issue of the factions and the fact that they were following certain leaders. So Paul has been using a lot of images and a lot of general teaching here. He's going to get a little bit more specific in chapter 4. But before we get there, notice in chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 18, 
Paul's going to give three reasons or three ways that we're to view leaders, but he starts off with the proper mindset we're to have. And whether that starts this section off or concludes the last one, we're not sure. He didn't have chapter divisions, obviously, in the original. Uh, and then he's going to conclude with an admonition uh, as a father, as he asks them how he should come to them, either with a rod and discipline or with gentleness. But uh, notice as we begin in chapter 3 and verse 18. Here he says, Let no one deceive himself. If any among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Here he gives two important instructions about the right type of mindset. First of all, he says, let no one deceive himself. We tend to do that a lot, don't we? <laughs> a lot of times the person we lie to the most is ourselves. We deceive Ourselves, We rationalize away sin or we, we consider what we're thinking in the, the best intentions, regardless of how we're acting. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool. They had elevated the, the wisdom of the world. And Paul reminds them that, that if you want to truly be wise, then you need to give that up. You need to become a fool. You need to be one that serves God and follows after his so-called foolishness, as we saw in chapter 1. So he says, give all of that up. It reminds us of some of the statements we find in the Gospels when Jesus says, the first shall become last, and the last shall become first. Or anyone that desires to, to follow after me must deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. To, to be a Christian means to give up, to let go of the, this claim that we have of ourselves, to trying to find wisdom in ourselves. You know, we so much often try to elevate ourselves above others, above others based upon accomplishments, achievements, or some kind of wisdom or thing like that. Paul says, give that up. Give that up. If you want to be wise, then become as a fool so that you can be truly wise, wise according to what God would offer. He reminds them in verse 19, for the wisdom of the world is folly with God. God often uses unconventional ways and means so that people can learn not to rely upon themselves when he offers them salvation. The wisdom of the world is folly with God. And notice that he quotes a couple of different passages. One is from Job chapter 5, and the other is from Psalm 94. The quotes are found in verses 19 and 20. He catches the wise in their craftiness. That's a quote from Job 5 in the words of uh, Eliphaz the Temanite. In verse 20, he quotes Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. We'll not have time to go into all the context of everything that's found there, but both of those passages at least allude to or refer to a reversal. Paul has been addressing that, hasn't he, already? That God lifts up the brokenhearted, the poor, and he brings down those that are wise, wise in their own eyes, the powerful. And so God is able to bring about this reversal in the gospel. And notice that Paul is calling upon them to do that themselves, to lower themselves, to humble themselves. And he quotes these verses uh, to make that point. The second thing he says in verse 21, so let no one boast in men. The right mindset is one of humility, of lowering oneself, but it's also of viewing other people in the right light. He says, do not boast 
in men. That's exactly what they were doing. They had their favorite teacher or the one that they had belonged to. And that was a source of arrogance and pride for them. If they could attach themselves to the right teacher, that lifted them up. Paul says, do not boast in men. Do not boast there. Do not make that your boast, but boast in the Lord. He says, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. My understanding of this statement here is that Paul is mimicking or, or quoting the, the thoughts or philosophy of the cynics and the stoics that believe that the wise man owns all things. The wise man owns all things. Paul says, in true wisdom, if you own all of these things, he goes through and lists these, all these things are yours. But notice in verse 23, however he's using that as, as a quote of what they thought would happen. Notice verse 23 is the, the, the punchline, the true uh, statement of fact that he brings. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Whatever they would think about what they owned or what belonged to them or what they were claiming for themselves. The point is found in verse 23. You are Christ. You are Christ. So Paul says here that they need to have the right mindset as they think about their leaders as we head into chapter 4. So how should we view leaders in the church? Well, Paul says, first of all, you should regard Leaders as faithful stewards, as faithful stewards. Notice in verses 1 through 5, he says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commandment from God. How should we view Paul? Uh, and I'll just make a quick point here. This is not only how we should view leaders, but this is also how, view, uh, how leaders should view themselves in a sense. A lot of churches uh, have leaders that have become so caught up with the idea of getting more people in. There's a temptation of pride for leaders. And Paul's making this statement as one who was a leader in the church. So I'll just point out that, that leaders need to be careful themselves not to be proud and haughty. And, and we should also view our leaders in the same respect. But notice what he says. How should we view the leaders as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God? Now he's already made that statement in chapter 3 and verse 5. Remember he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? And he says, they are servants through whom you believed. They are field hands. They are the ones that are working the field of the master. They are the servants of God. He made a slightly different point there that they are all working together for God's purposes. But he's going to make a different point here. His point is found in verses 2 and 3. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. The task or the job of a steward is to be found faithful. Let me unpack that a little bit. A, a steward was simply a servant that was entrusted with uh, typically a great deal of wealth with the master's estate or the master's business interest when he would depart and go away on a journey. And so this was an important servant. Because he was entrusted. He was given a tremendous amount of, of uh, responsibility. But it was not for what he possessed. He was in service to the master. That's what a steward did. His job, his primary task, was to be faithful. To execute the wishes of the master. 
In fact, we see examples of this in the parables of Jesus when he talks about the fact that, that, the, uh, that the master will depart. And when he comes back, how will he find that steward acting? For example, in Luke chapter 12, and I'll just mention this one verse here. There are several parables we could look at. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 42, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them the portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Here we see this idea that who is the good servant? Well, it's the one that is doing the job he's supposed to when he comes. In that case, handing out or dispensing the food to the other servants. What does it mean to be a, a steward of God? What is the responsibility there? It is to be faithful. It is to be faithful. It's not a popularity contest. It's not about how many people like you here. The task is to be faithful to the master. Now notice his point here, in, as he begins in verse 3. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. We get some indication that the Corinthians actually were, uh, were scrutinizing or uh, talking bad possibly about Paul and his authority. Paul says, my job is not to make you happy. My job is not to, to, again, engage in some kind of popularity contest. My job is not to do all those things. My job is to be faithful. Leaders need to remember that, don't they? <laughs> our job here for our preachers, elders, those that lead in any way, it, it's not a popularity contest. It's not about simply, merely getting numbers. Now, there is a soul behind every number, and we care about every soul, but the goal is not mere numbers. The goal is to be faithful to God, to be faithful to God. I, I think about Paul in, in this way. He grew up in a tight-knit religious community among the Jews. He went to the school. I, I'm sure that when he went places, they knew about people in common. Oh, have you heard about this brother? Did you hear about this uh, one that was uh, preaching among you? Did you hear about that? It was a tight-knit community. But notice he had to put all of that aside in order to become a Christian. He was a champion among his people because he persecuted the Jews. But he had to give all of that up in order to serve God. I, I, I think about what he had to give up and why. He had to give up family relationships. He had to give up those that had known him for a long time. A lot of that community, he had to be willing to give that up in order to serve the Lord. I, I find it very important that this, this really grounds me. <laughs> I feel like I grew up in a, a tight religious community uh, with many good people that I loved and cared about. But this grounds me because this tells me that my goal is not to make everyone around me happy. My goal is not simply to avoid upsetting anyone. My goal is to be faithful to the Lord. And we need to make that our priority, to put that first and foremost. I think sometimes we can become afraid of how others might react and that can overshadow what we think and what we believe and know is what we should be doing. And that's a shame. <laughs> we need to put God first and foremost and rely upon His Word above all else. We need to see leaders, and really we need to see ourselves <laughs> as simply faithful stewards. We've been entrusted with a task of the Lord, and it is our primary objective and goal to please Him, to please Him. Secondly, we need to see leaders as servants of the Word, servants of the Word. Notice in verses 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7. I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn 
by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Paul's been using a lot of images, as I mentioned. In fact, we saw three of those images in the last chapter. He even brought up Apollos earlier in chapter 1, where he talks about uh, Apollos and what he was, was doing and how many people were following after Apollos. But notice now he says that I, I've applied all of these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, that you may learn not to go beyond what is written. He'd use a lot of images, right? And now he gets down to something very explicit. He says, I, I went through all of this so that you might learn not to go beyond what is written. In a very general sense, we know that we're not to go beyond God's word. We're not to change God's word. We're not to deviate to the right and to the left. That's the instruction found in uh, in the words of Moses, as he talks about the old law, we're not to be flippant with God's word or to change it. That, that's a general truth, a, a fundamental truth. I think Paul, though, is going beyond that general truth to a very specific truth, specifically what is written. In these first three chapters, we've seen Paul quote the Old Testament six different times. And with Nearly every one, the majority of these times, the point was that you should not boast in men, but you should boast in the Lord. You should rely not upon your own wisdom and strength, but upon God. I think that's the very specific point, the very specific scripture that he's referencing. You should not go beyond that. How are they doing that? <laughs> by violating that scripture that he's quoted throughout these times. They were going beyond because they were living in pride and arrogance and they were boasting in men and not in God. So Paul says, don't go beyond these things. Notice we see the, the, uh, the impact of this statement in verse 7 or at the end of verse 6 that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. If we would but heed the Scripture, specifically the ones He's given, then we'll not be arrogant, will we? I think about that attitude and how it applies, both in how we would form a faction, but in our service to the Lord. If we are living in arrogance, we say, almost in effect, we don't need you, God. I know what I'm doing. I'm wiser than what you would have to tell me. And Paul says, don't let that be the case. Don't be arrogant in your attitude toward God, His Word, or other people. <coughs> Verse 7, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? <laughs> Why are you boasting as if you've invented something or as you have some great wisdom that applies only to what you, who you are? But instead, you have been given, gifted these things. And so act accordingly as one that has gratefully received, not as some kind of master yourself that deserves to be arrogant above all. So how should we view leaders? As faithful stewards and also as servants of the word. The third case found in verses 8 through 13, Paul gets a little sarcastic as he deals with these that uh, people that are wise in their own eyes. And I didn't know a way to describe this, but maybe we should view leaders as sufferers for the cause. Notice in verse 8. Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and, and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. 
When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. The Corinthians, in their wisdom, were scratching and clawing for the top. They were scratching and clawing for recognition, for status, that they might be seen as the top. And Paul says, even without us, you've achieved that. You think that you're high and mighty, you become rich, you're reigning like kings, but what is the nature of a disciple? Is it to scratch and claw to the top, to outdo one another, to receive as much recognition and status as we can get? Not at all. That's missed the entire point. In fact, Paul says that, that as apostles, this is not a matter of just receiving some great recognition or some title of honor, but this is a work of service in which the apostles suffered for the cause. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake. We are weak. They're held in disre uh, disrepute. He says, they're, hunger, uh, they're hungry and thirsty. They're poorly dressed, homeless. They labor and work. And why, why do they do all these things? Because <laughs> they were sufferers for the cause. They believed in what they were doing. And, and Paul even says that God has made us a, a spectacle to the world. People look upon us. I'm sure there are many things that people of the world thought about the apostles in the first century. Th those people are crazy. They are fanatics. They, they are out of their minds. I also thought about that word spectacle and the fact that, that even today we look at the apostles and the service that they gave to God. And we even use their service as evidence of the truthfulness of what they said. A lot of people say that the apostles made up the resurrection. They simply imagined that it happened. But the truth of the matter is they were so devoted to the cause. No liar would be that devoted because they did endure all of these things, didn't they? They did suffer. They did ultimately give their lives for the cause. And they did all of that not for a lie. <laughs> you can hold on to a lie for a little bit, but once someone threatens you with harm or once you see the difficulty of it, you give that up. Because you lie to benefit yourself. So were they lying about the resurrection? Not at all. God had made them a spectacle in all of the difficulties that they endured, the suffering that they endured. But they did that for the cause and for the truth of what they had seen. They had seen the resurrected Christ. And they were willing to die for that fact. Now Paul uses all of that to rebuke the Corinthians who instead of suffering for the cause were scratching for notoriety and, and status. If we ever do that as Christians, we need to be rebuked in the same way. Being a Christian is not about simply having a title and getting a lot of respect and everyone pats us on the back. Being a Christian is about being devoted to our Master. And serving him no matter what. Giving him all of our life. And so we need to view leaders in the church as stewards, as servants, and as sufferers. Paul is going to conclude this section in chapter 4 uh, by saying that, that I don't say all these things to make you ashamed, but really I want to admonish you as my children Uh, Paul had begotten them in the gospel. He was their father in some sense. And so he, he concludes with a very fatherly statement. I'm, I'm coming to see you. Now, do you want me to come with a rod or with gentleness? Basically, you choose how you're going to respond to what I've said here. Respond to my instruction, his fatherly instruction. Well, there's a lot of things we can learn as we think about this lesson The first thing we need to understand is that God is the master of all. God is the master of all. If we follow certain people or elevate certain people, what we've done when we do that is we've really lowered God, haven't we? 
if we claim to follow some person, we've moved God out of the equation. We've forgotten that He truly is the Master. If we say I'm a disciple or a follower of some human being, we have de-elevated or pushed God down. But God is the true Master of all. He is the master of our lives. He is the one that directs us all. And we need to focus our attention on who truly is the most important. It is God Almighty. God is our master. We also need to let humility reign in the church. We should be known as humble people. There is work to be done, and we need to have leaders that step up to do the work but leading and working and being a Christian is not about status. It's not about pride. When we outdo one another, that's only for love and for their good. <laughs> not so that we can be puffed up and we can be shown to be better than others. No, we need to let humility reign in the church. Where there is arrogance, there will likely be divisions of some sort. But where there is humility, there is much less likely chance of any kind of division happening. We need Christians to live lives of humility, and then as we interact with one another in the church, to continue to live out that humility. Jesus Christ, our greatest example, Lord of all, humbled himself. How much more should we? So we need to let humility reign in the church. And we need to put leaders in their proper place. Now, this isn't said like someone that gets mad at the preacher. You know, I didn't like what he said. We need to put that preacher in his place. Not like that. Now, sometimes we can push the leaders so far down that we criticize everything they do, and it's not humanly possible to be pleasing to anybody. That's not their proper place, to push them down to the, the, the dirt. But neither is it their proper place to, to say that I'm following this preacher and I'm a disciple of this preacher no matter what. I think it's sad to see when a popular preacher leaves a church, then a bunch of the congregates also leave. And maybe they go somewhere else, maybe they don't, they just left. Who were they converted to if they're there for the preacher? We need to be converted to Christ. Preachers, we need to hold up their hand. Elders, we need to hold up their hands. Those that are working in the kingdom, we need to hold up their hands as servants. We need to encourage as servants. But we should not elevate too highly so that we think of them as our master in any sort of way. God is our master. And God is our ultimate judge. I hope this lesson has been helpful for you. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you have an opportunity to obey the gospel message. As was mentioned in chapter 4, Paul says that God is our judge and God will judge us one day. If you're here tonight and not a Christian, you need to know that the judgment day is a real thing and that God will ultimately judge you. As a sinner, you're in need of God and His grace and mercy. You need to rely upon what He can offer you and He can give you forgiveness. If you'll but believe that Jesus is the Christ, repent of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Christ, and being baptized in the water for forgiveness of sins. If you're here tonight and you are a Christian but not honoring the commitment that you made, you also need to make changes. If there's any subject to the invitation, please come as we stand and sing at this time.